questions. So as we prep again uh, for this webinar, let me go back. Um, so again, just make sure everyone who's here is in the right place. Uh, this is APM Help's uh, first webinar that's public, publicly available per se, um, specifically around embezzlement in the property management industry, and of course, how to, how to avoid it and try to stop it um, or prevent. Um, I've done this presentation. So hi, my name is Taylor. I am the chief happiness officer, really more so the, the, the main consultant or one of the senior consultants over at APM Help. Um, and, you know, essentially we see these kinds of things happen quite literally almost every day. There's new clients that come to us with these problems. And so we really, really, really wanted to, um, we really wanted to just put this stuff out there, right? Put it out there, help you guys, because, you know, quite frankly, these things, it, it really does happen. Um, and um, some of y'all, I don't know if, 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 if any of you guys have seen my presentation before for other NARPM um, chapters, but this is very similar to a prior uh, presentation where um, that one's aptly named like how to embezzle from a property manager. Now, obviously the, the intent is not to teach people how to embezzle, but more so similarly try to prevent it um, and catch it if it is happening. Um, but, but today we are, um, we are going to change up our little formats quite a little bit by bringing in one of our actual clients, uh, Jesse, um, who hopefully um, can, can kind of chat with you guys more so on a colleague to colleague kind of basis where, you know, at his firm, at his PM company, they, they had these issues. And so um, after I give about four or five examples, we're going to have him talk about his real life example himself. So looks like we are uh, five minutes past. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, hi, everyone. My name is Taylor. Uh, I am the chief happiness officer here at APM Help. Um, you know, the topic today is really about embezzlement. Um, we see it all the time with our, um, our clients, uh, as well as prospects who um, just PM companies out there that are dealing with this. Um, and we're really trying to just put out knowledge out there and just add value of just how to prevent this, how to stop it, um, how to catch it, how to even see it happening. Um, and the format here is these are all real life examples. Um, of course, they're anonymized, um, but they're real examples from real clients that we have helped um, essentially get past this or find out how, or uh, ultimately in Jesse's example, um, catch the person and actually get, um, you know, get to a kind of final conclusion on, on, on recouping some stuff as well. And so um, APM Help, uh, you know, look, if you don't know who we are yet, we're a tech-enabled accounting firm or back office services firm. We specialize in app folio building and property wear today. And, uh, you know, again, we, we really want to just get some knowledge out there about some of the things that we, ha we see happening all the time. Um, and also throughout the uh, presentation, on every slide, we do have an opportunity. Uh, we have some canned questions that we're going to ask the audience. Um, but if you have any questions throughout, you're welcome to chat them as well as in the Q&A, just post your question. Um, if it's relevant to that specific topic, we're, you know, I have my team in here. And so they'll, they'll kind of raise a flag and make sure we, we address it immediately. Um, and regardless, uh, this is going to be about an hour, about maybe 55 minutes here. Um, the first kind of 20 minutes will be my examples and the structure of those examples is going to be, I'm going to tell you the story. Um, I'm going to tell you about the warning signs that they should have seen or we saw um, after the fact. And then what are the key takeaways to, again, hopefully prevent the embezzlement uh, from happening. Um, uh, after that, the, after these, ex the first handful of examples, I'm going to introduce Jesse as, as well as Lauren. Um, Jesse is a colleague of you guys. He's actually in the property management industry and um, he's going to tell you guys about his real life story, right? Uh, instead of kind of hearing it from us as like a, you know, a vendor to the industry per se, we wanted to bring in an actual example and have you guys hear it from them. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to leave about 10 minutes at the very end for just general Q&A. Um, again, just keep in mind because this is recorded and we will be sharing this to the public, um, any questions that anyone may have, please just try to make sure you're not putting any kind of personally identifiable information in it. Um, and obviously any kind of information you don't want that to be out there in the public. So beyond that, uh, again, just high level, you know, these are real stories, but they're not intended to scare you. It's really intended to provide awareness uh, to what is possible. Um, and all of these situations were absolutely preventable. 
All right. So the first story I'm going to get into um, is um, one where essentially there was a property management company, um, pretty typical. This one was around 400 units. Um, and what ended up happening was um, one person, so let's just say, and it was actually a partner of this company, one of the partners um, was handling the accounting bookkeeping side of the business, um, the CFO, you can call her the COO. And um, anytime security deposits came in from tenants, anytime rent came in that were essentially money orders, cashier's checks, right? What, what we call in the industry like certified funds, um, like what, what this person was doing was, and this was after the fact we found out, they actually were taking those funds to a casino and swapping them for casino chips. And you have to understand casinos are kind of in this gray area of like, are they really a bank? Eh, no, but they, you know, a casino, especially a more shady one for probably would see certified funds as that's as good as cash. And so they have no problems turning, taking your cash per se or cash equivalent and turning it into IOUs of casino chips, plastic chips, essentially. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, this one came to light primarily because um, eventually they ran out of money in their security deposit accounts, right? Um, when they were finally doing refunds, you know, the, the, the security deposit account over, I think it was the course of six years, slowly was being chipped away at. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, all it took was one owner withdrawing their properties who had like a handful of them. And they realized we don't have enough money to actually pay back the owner of their security deposits. And so that obviously kind of kicks off this financial review and it turns into this massive snowball of, holy crap, we haven't ever done a bank rack. <laughs> um, and that's kind of where we came in um, for this specific client. You know, we came in and realized they had never done a bank rack for six years. and you know, as we methodically were getting through the bank wrecks, we started seeing some of these warning signs. Um, and, and some of these warning signs aren't specifically from the software or the accounting software, but they are more so in person or in your day to day, um, you could see these. So that COO or partner was extremely insistent, apparently, from any kind of money that was being taken to the bank. They were like, I'm going to do it. I always got this. Let me take the money to the bank. Right. Um, and so that person was not only responsible for entering in, for example, security deposit receipts or payments, uh, depending on the software you use, um, they were responsible for entering the payments, they were making the deposits, and they were also technically responsible for making or doing the reconciliations. Um, some other warning signs for this was essentially uh, throughout, actually, it was kind of a, a light bulb moment um, where as we were kind of unearthing this and peeling back the onion, Right, the other partner was like, oh my gosh, I saw these warning signs a lot earlier. Essentially, it was tenants were complaining that the security deposit refunds weren't being sent to them. Right, in a lot of states, this is actually a compliance thing. You only have like 30 days in most states, but um, regardless what this other partner was doing was uh, they were waiting for the new tenant to move in to pay their security deposit to then ultimately uh, refund the security deposit to the old tenants, right? And so depending on if the property or the listing was hot or not, and whether they can place a tenant quickly, you know, that was completely dependent, the refund was completely dependent on the new tenants, right? And then beyond there, um, one thing that was abundantly clear was there were unreconciled deposits or unclear deposits in the software. So if you were doing, or if they were doing the bank recs, they would have seen that supposedly money was being collected, we received it, we gave the tenant the receipt um, saying, hey, we got this money. But on the way to the bank, somehow it went missing. And so they never showed up in the bank. And so um, again, very big warning signs could have definitely prevented this um, you know, very, very early on, but fundamentally they weren't doing bank recs. And so some of the key takeaways here, right? Um, in this specific situation, in everyone's situation, you don't want to have a single person doing the entire flow, right? From collecting money to depositing money to reconciling the money and providing financials. Always have multiple people involved, right? Um, we always ask our clients to require proof of all payments. And this is not the tenant providing proof, but more so internally. Um, it's nowadays in, in the world of unlimited storage per se in the cloud. There's nothing wrong with taking a picture of whatever, you know, check, money order, cashier's check, heck, even cash, right? Like 
cash all has unique identifiers, you can utilize that stuff to then track it um, to the bank. Um, and then of course, the number one thing that we're, you're gonna hear from me throughout this is you gotta be doing bank recs. Cool, uh, I'm gonna stop briefly. Any questions or any thoughts around this specific topic? And if not, then I'll go ahead and move on to the next one or the next example. I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, our next example I want to talk about, um, yep, uh, so Michael Cox, a fantastic little comment there. Good policies require electronic payments. Um, uh, absolutely, especially in, uh, in this day and age, but this next story or this next example is um, unfortunately related to ACH and e-checks, uh, and it is very COVID relevant. Um, so the, in this story specifically, what we saw was um, and and this is this is happening recently as well due to COVID. Uh, well, I don't want to say due to COVID, but people are taking advantage of the COVID situation. Um, in this specific example, a tenant um, about to be moving out, they double paid rent supposedly on accident. And when they double pay rent, right, and they actually paid through ACH or eCheck um, or electronically. Right, the, the PM, you know, of course the tenant's like, oh my gosh, I accidentally double paid rent. Can you send me back a check, right? Um, you, you guys need to be very, very careful. What this tenant actually did was um, they double paid the rent, requested the PM to send them a check. The PM's check, of course, is good. And a couple months down the road, after the tenant moves out, but received not only their secure deposit and their double payment of rent back, they charge all of it back. And they just tell the bank, all of this is fraudulent. And so, yeah, you know, this could happen six months later, but six months later, all of that money gets taken back. And of course, unfortunately, in our financial system in America specifically, you know, the, the, the consumer is always right first. And so they're going to take your money, even though you may be able to prove that, you know, it was warranted, they're going to take it. And in that amount of time, they could very easily walk away with, you know, a thousand bucks on average, $6,000. Right, it's just going to get withdrawn from your bank account, um, and so you know, just be very, very careful, especially during COVID times right now. Chargebacks on any kind of payment that has the ability to do chargebacks, like credit cards, honestly, checks, ACH, and we've even seen money orders get called back because they keep the um, the like receipt portion. They can go back and just say, hey. Uh, you know, that this, this was fraudulent, right? Or, you know, someone random cashed this or something like that. Um, and so this is, this one's a very hard one to deal with, especially right now. Um, and uh, some of the warning signs, uh, especially like with these tenants, too perfect of a candidate is actually an interesting one where it's, it's, it's almost like a warning sign or a yellow warning sign you need to look out for, right? Like if they're kind of like, you know, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay double security deposit. I'll prepay three months up front, right? Like, you know, in COVID times, are people really doing that with their cash? Like, most people are hoarding cash, right? So you want to kind of look out for some, you know, too perfect of some candidates these days. Um, and also remember, like, if someone, for example, like recently just got evicted, those evictions aren't going to show up, right, anywhere for at least a couple of months. Right, so just be careful of like really great looking candidates these days, um, but potentially it's kind of like, you know, why are you moving, right? Uh, beyond that, payments that aren't consistent uh, with other ones, in the specific example there, you know, the tenant had never double paid before. So it's kind of like, why would you double pay now, right, especially upon move out? Um, and then the big one here is demanding a refund check instead of refunding to the credit card or doing a chargeback. And this is actually something that we kind of, I wouldn't call it recommend, but this is one of those business decisions you need to make. Sometimes, although taking a charge back or an NSF, you know, triggers a fee on your bank account, that fee is finite. It's limited. It's 20 or $30. It's much better to take a fee like 30 bucks uh, than to refund, you know, rents and then potentially have this liability of like six months on the road, they can charge back all of it. Right, so that's something you guys need to definitely look out for. Some of the key takeaways here, absolutely be methodical um, and objective when it comes to the money you accept, right? You know, these are definitely kind of unfortunate situations where tenants or consumers are taking advantage of these situations. 
We've even seen owners do something like this too. Well, they'll make an online owner contribution and then they'll actually charge it back. So just, just be careful, right? Especially during COVID times, the, we're in weird times right now, right? Do you understand what the risks are, right? Uh, not to call out Michael here, but like, you know, requiring electronic payments are great, um, but, you know, there are still risks associated. Like just because it hits your bank does not mean, you know, it can't, uh, it can't be taken back away. And, and again, just last takeaway, always absolutely make sure you're doing your bank recs. Um, you know, we, we unfortunately have clients come in that because they aren't doing bank recs, they're not catching the facts that this is happening or something similar like this is happening to them. And so before they know it, they're out 20 grand and they're like, how did this happen? Right. And, you know, it happened over the course of however long where they weren't doing bank recs. Um, cool. So I'll. It does look like there's some comments. Uh, the most recent one, Esteban is asking, you know, are we suggesting only accept cash? I'm not suggesting that. Obviously, there are, you know, th th there are pros and cons to all of the different kind of payment methods, especially with cash. Obviously, that's in-person stuff, which, you know, we're, we're still all trying to avoid per se, right? Um, and so, you know, like, don't get me wrong, cash is king, right? Wires are technically king, uh, where if you don't have the ability to actually take it back, you know, like those are, those are typically great. But um, again, just in these times, it's really hard to necessarily say you should absolutely only take cash, right? Um, beyond that, so Michael had asked some questions or commented. So Michael, you actually had someone try this on you. You saw through and were able to, to prevent it. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and then... Yeah, so you you would refund after 30 days, right? And then on day 31, they did the chargeback. Um, yeah, so uh, again, this is happening, guys, right? Like, Michael, I don't know where you're at per se, but um, I mean, this is absolutely happening. And, and keep in mind with different payment methods, you know, it can be up to six months. Some banks will even do it up to 12 months, right? And it's not something you can really honestly prevent or, um, or, or, or do anything against, unfortunately, but you know, just, just keep, keep, keep in mind about these things. Um, Karen, the question was, Karen asked the question, can we tell by looking at a payment whether the resident paid via checking account or a credit card? So that depends on the software you're using, right? So if you're using something like Appfolio, um, I believe Appfolio does enable you to actually see this. Um, Whereas with building and property, I'm, I apologize, I'm not the building and property were expert per se, so um, I can't necessarily answer that. But um, yeah, and, and 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 what's good about some of these uh, softwares is that they do pay via credit card, um, or at least like application fees and things. Uh, they make it pretty easy to do a refund. So uh, one thing I would absolutely say is if anyone demands a refund check. That's something that I would say is a red flag. Try not to do refund checks these days, at least right now. Cool. So lots of great chats and you know, comments, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> so this next story is around friends and family vendors, right? So um, essentially this is, this, this is primarily related to maintenance coordination. Um, if you're you know, of course, most PM companies typically will, will coordinate maintenance on behalf of their owners or properties um, or for tenants, um, do turnovers, things like that. Um, just in this story specifically, um, one of our uh, clients had a property manager that, you know, essentially was vending off cleaning or turnover cleanings to one specific vendor. Um, and how this was caught was essentially um, like, money was owed, but then all of a sudden, you know, like they had just written a check. Like they skipped all the company's kind of processes on how to cut a check to a new vendor per se, and just wrote a check. And eventually they were able to find out very quickly that, you know, that the vendor was associated, right? Even though it was shielded by like a weird LLC name, the ultimate person that was doing the work was uh, the actual baby mama of uh, the property manager who was doing this. And uh, weirdly enough, uh, in this specific situation, the amount of money that was being paid every month to this vendor happened to be eerily close to uh, the child support payments uh, that were being uh, being required uh, for for the for the kids essentially. 
Um, you know, these warning signs or the warning signs for, for, for this specific kind of example, um, any kind of reimbursements to staff, right? So whenever, you know, hopefully you guys are big enough as, as PMCs or property management companies where you have credit cards for your company or debit cards for your company, don't try to let your staff use their own personal cards and then get reimbursed, right? That's, that's typically one of the warning signs you want to be careful of. Another one is inconsistent invoice amounts. Um, so, you know, if you vend out to a vendor and they go and fix a plumbing issue um, or like a toilet leak or something like that, and then the next one randomly is an extra 50 bucks, and then the next one after that's like, you know, $25 less, you know, similar jobs should be usually the same, right? But if you see inconsistent amounts, that's typically like, huh, maybe something's going on. And another one uh, from a different story, actually, a different example was uh, personal communication. Um, the maintenance coordinator, you know, would constantly just text his vendors per se and, or their vendors. And, you know, like, that's great that you have a, you know, personal great connection with your vendors, but, you know, this one was specifically on a personal phone and it turned out, again, this was, this was family. And so when it was family, it was a little too close and, you know, don't get me wrong. There's always a little bit of like, ah, it's family or we trust them or whatever it is. Maybe the, the invoices are slightly higher. Um, and unfortunately, that's just something that happens throughout. But, um, you know, just just be careful in these kinds of situations when you're when you guys are hiring friends and family. Um, so the key takeaways here, um, we do recommend our clients to be extremely transparent, um, almost overly transparent about their policies on hiring friends and family, especially if you're in small town America or just not as a small town, but just places where you you guys don't have as many plumbers, you don't have as many electricians that are you know, out there available, right? Like working with friends and family sometimes just becomes a necessity. And if it is, you know, we just ask that, or we, we recommend our clients to be very transparent about it uh, with their owners. Um, and then similarly, if that friend or family is hired for a job or is picked for the job, the person that made the decision to pick them is not the related person, right, on your team. That way you have some kind of plausible deniability about like, hey, actually it was this person, you know, at our company that made the decision. Um, or the best way to do it is, you know, present options to the owner, let them pick. And if they happen to pick your friends and family, you know, you're off the hook kind of thing. Cool. Any questions about this one? Any comments? Awesome. Uh, cool. So I've got two more. I'm going to move a little quicker because we're, we're, we're a little bit on, short on time here. Um, the next one is changing bank information. Um, now, this one um, specifically, we've seen, unfortunately, a little too many times uh, on Appfolio users. Um, but uh, the story is essentially, uh, as the PM or as a maintenance coordinator, or as the bookkeeper, um, usually their user permission enables them to change bank info or payment info on any vendor or owner, pretty much at a click of any button. And what was happening was um, payments were supposedly going out. Owner distributions were supposedly being paid to owners, but what the bookkeeper had done was they went into the owner and they updated the bank routing info and account info to their own. And, and so although in the software, it looks like the owner was getting paid, the money was actually being sent or directed to a different bank account. and um, ultimately, the warning sign or how they caught this was, of course, the owner is like, hey, I haven't been paid in two months. What's going on? Right. And, you know, we typically get called. We look and we say, no, it actually looks like the owner's getting paid. We can see the you know, transfer confirmation or the payment confirmation. And so we usually will say something like, can, can the owner like share a bank statement or, you know, can we, can we verify that the owner is not getting the money? And if that happens, a lot of times also, you know, let, let's say they do show it, it's like, yeah, they're not getting any money. We go into the actual records of the, um, like the owner record, for example, or owner profile in Appfolio. And at least now what's good is Appfolio has an audit log or audit trail of any information that has changed, right? Unfortunately though, there's no alert that says like, oh my gosh, hey, the vendor or this owner's information has been changed. It's kind of this, you know, after the fact, you can kind of find it thing. Um, whereas like even six months ago, you couldn't find any of this. Um, and, and that was a big, big, big problem. 
Um, so some of the warning signs, obviously, so complaints from your tenants, owners, vendors, anyone who's supposed to, who's expecting money from you guys, where you think you paid them, but they're not getting paid. Um, another one that was interesting was uh, the HOA. The HOA was supposedly getting paid, uh, but they weren't. And so they were starting to assess late fees. And the PM company was like, we have proof that we're paying you. Here, here's the ACH confirmation. And the HOA is like, no, nope, we haven't gotten anything. Right. So be careful about these. Um, usually the way you can kind of prevent this is limit people's access or permission levels. Granted, Abfolios, for example, is not as granular as it could be, um, including same with property wear and buildium. So uh, be careful about this one. Um, and yeah, I actually, I just talked on the takeaways. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, so Michael just commented, so it sounds like Michael, you use Abfolio. Um, yeah, the audit log does show it. Unfortunately, the audit log does not uh, tell people that something has been changed. So if you use Abfolio, that's an absolute fantastic feature request. So Michael, if you wanna submit that, um, we're all happy to upvote the feature request, right? It's like, make it very simple. Any bank information that is being changed should trigger an email to you know, whatever users on an Appfolio database. Very good. All right, so this is the last one or the last example um, to, about embezzlement per se, and then we're gonna get into, I'll introduce Jesse here, but um, essentially this one is about fake or hidden or what Appfolio would like to call a corporate property um, and transactions on them. A lot of people don't understand that you know, this hidden or fake property that has like my company name on it, but that's not really a managed property. Whatever's happening on there doesn't really mean anything to me. Uh, that is unfortunately not the case in like 99% of the situations. Um, if you ever are carrying a balance, a negative balance, especially on a corporate fake or hidden property, um, including old properties you've managed that are no longer being managed, um, you know, like maybe you started properties, but you didn't necessarily move someone in. Any balance that's on any property that shouldn't be there actually does affect your PM company. And if it's negative, that's not good. Okay. Um, and for all of you that use, for example, at Folio, it's the trust account balance report that we always pull, but you want to make sure you show all properties. Okay. Um, and so in the warning signs here, so the reports are specifically not just active reports, but all, uh, or not active properties, but all properties. Same thing with Buildium. Um, in Buildium, all the reports default to the active units or active portfolios um, and owners. Make sure you're looking at all, right? Including hidden. Um, and if you're using uh, Propertyware, there are some great reports. One that's by default, it's called portfolio balances with the less than sign, zero. If you pull that report and you've got any portfolios that are less than zero, bad sign, okay? Um, and so really essentially the story here is, you know, transactions are happening on a corporate property. They just happen. It's, you know, paying a utility bill, paying a mortgage for the company, right? Like um, sometimes it's like you, 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 if you're doing reconciliation, sometimes you're, you're paying on behalf of your owner um, and you forget the owner. And so you don't really know what happened. So you just like dump it onto a hidden property, right? Or your corporate property and say, I'll get to it later, right? Those negatives are actually borrowing money from other owners, okay? Um, and then finally, the last one is uh, if your bank balance uh, seems a little low, you're bouncing checks, right? Um, and this is, this, is a, this is a typical warning sign, like back of the napkin math warning sign that you always should be maintaining. So for your properties, as well as your security deposit accounts, right? For properties, if you distribute all your money down to zero and don't leave maintenance reserves, then your bank balance should be pretty close to zero, plus or minus essentially some uncleared um, checks essentially, right? Or if you have a hundred properties with a hundred dollars in maintenance reserves for each one, you're probably looking at, uh, what is that? $10,000, right? Um, that you should be maintaining in that account. Um, and so key takeaways here on your fake or hidden property ones in this example, do back of the napkin math at all times, right? Like if you got 200 properties, you know, the thousand dollars of security deposits for each one on average, or you should have about $200,000 in security deposits in your security deposit bank account, right? Another key takeaway that's pretty interesting 
ask for random reports, right? If you have a bookkeeper or accountant or someone else who's doing your books, right? Don't just trust that they're saying, oh, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. We're good. Right? Like, just be like, look, just, just pull the report, right? With, with, in this day and age, building a portfolio popular and all these modern cloud-based softwares or browser-based softwares, you can literally generate a report in two seconds. And if they're not willing to do something like that, that's a warning sign, okay? And then again, obviously do your bank recs. Um, cool, so I'm gonna jump quickly into the chats. I think I saw, was it Steve that, uh, that raised your hand? Um, okay, he said, never mind. cool. Um, so it, without ado, I'd like to introduce Jesse. Um, to, I mean, he's been here. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Um, I'd like to introduce Jesse. Um, Jesse is a, a is a is a fellow property management um, company. I guess property manager, right? Um, and um, unfortunately, he has been through this uh, firsthand. And um, again, the point here is we didn't want to just stand up here and talk to you guys about you know examples. We wanted to actually let you guys hear it, you know, straight from a colleague, essentially. So. Um, Jesse, why don't you take it from there? Okay, thanks, Taylor. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Uh, we have a property management company uh, that's smaller. Um, we have a staff of three people and me. Uh, we have a sort of a lead property manager. We have a bookkeeper. We have a transaction coordinator that helps with a lot of our real estate transactions. And uh, we have about 170 units, mostly single family homes. Um, going back to when this all started, I'm kind of going to phrase this before, during, and after. Um, so before we knew that we had an issue, um, we had a different bookkeeper than we do now. Uh, actually, most of our staff was different. And that bookkeeper was always complaining about at folio, um, and about the bank reconciliations. I came into the company um, about three years ago. And when I came in and started getting involved, um, I noticed that none of the QuickBooks accounts were reconciled. It made me a little bit nervous. Um, and so as a part of dealing with this bookkeeper's um, problems of always being behind and dealing with that folio, we actually hired a part-time bookkeeper. Uh, and that person is now our full-time bookkeeper. And we noticed that the, the older bookkeeper, the previous bookkeeper, she didn't let the new hire get into the books very much. Uh, she was always very choosy about what things um, the new bookkeeper could get involved with. Um, we also noticed that, you know, she would be the only one going to the bank. Um, she would very rarely let other people go to the bank for for her. Um, we actually ended up letting go of that uh, previous bookkeeper because of attendance reasons. And then our new bookkeeper um, started full time. And as she started going through the books and going through the monthly processes with our, we use that folio, um, she just started running into issues. Um, you know, she found that there were, um, she found that the, some of the general ledger accounts were uh, off. She found uh, that she kept running into issues with reconciliations. It just became, it just stacked up and up and up and up. And, uh, and what it, it kind of came to a head when um, we actually got a call from our bank saying, you know, your balance is really low. You tried to put through this payment and it's not going to go through. Uh, and that was a big red flag for us. We ended up um, putting some emergency funds in from our, uh, from our savings and actually from some of our personal family funds. And then we knew that we had to reconcile our bank accounts. And I, I certainly can't <laughs> stress again how much that helped us. So, you know, at the end of every slide where it said, do your bank recs, that's such just a good starter advice for everything. So we ended up hiring APM help um, to do bank reconciliation catch-ups or BRCUs. 
And um, that's when we started working with Taylor and Lauren and their team. Um, I don't know if you've been through this process, but when you're really behind on your bank reconciliation, you know, we have lots of different bank accounts. We have an operating account. We have different corporate accounts for owners that have six or more properties, which is what our state requires. Um, so we have lots of uh, accounts to go through. And when you do this, you basically, it's like a big Tetris game. You, you take um, transaction details and you match them up um, with bank accounts, with, uh, with that folio reports in our case. And then what you end up with is you end up with a bunch of missing transactions and um, Lauren and her team and also our bookkeeper would go into these missing transactions, which were largely made up of unreconciled deposits. And as we went through those, we found some common themes. Uh, we saw that a lot of the cash rents weren't actually showing up on our bank deposit. Um, you know, they were being entered into that folio, uh, but they weren't being put onto our bank uh, deposits. We also noticed that um, it was only happening on these visits where our uh, former bookkeeper was going to the bank. And we also noticed that we had missing cash receipts. So anytime we would take in cash in the office for rent, we would actually give the person a receipt, the tenant a receipt. But we noticed that a lot of those receipts were missing um, when we tried to go back and reconcile out these missing transactions. Um, so at this point, we knew we had a bunch of missing transactions. We knew that we had a bunch of missing money. And I remember uh, we, I was with Lauren on the phone and we were just looking at the spreadsheet going, okay, well, what's left here? And I said, well, you know, is this possible that this is an embezzlement? And Lauren said, I don't really see how it could be anything else. Um, and so at that point, you know, we knew that we needed to start taking some action. Um, we approached actually the former employee about it because this person was like family to us. She worked for us for many years. We're a family business. We try not to um, we try not to treat people as uh, anything other than family. And so we approached her personally before going to the authorities, and she was not open to talking to us about making us whole uh, or about even helping us figure out what happened with the money we went to her originally saying hey can you just help us out you know help us figure out where these funds are um, so after not having any luck there we did file charges with the local police department um, they asked for a lot of documentation uh, which luckily we were ahead on because of our uh, brcu process so they asked for deposit slips and bank statements spreadsheets uh, which contrasted our portfolio entries with our bank statements those cash receipts that I was talking about. And then um, after a while, it took quite a while, she did have a warrant issued for her arrest and they executed that. After that, there were multiple court dates um, where you know there was a whole legal process of which I'm not really certain what happened. The DA's office took it over at some point. Um, and then at some point we started working with the, the district attorney's office directly about building this case. And one thing that, you know, if you're unfortunate enough to go through this, um, you know, white collar crimes, while they're huge to us, they aren't necessarily the first priority for, um, for the DA's office and for local police departments. So it took a lot of follow up. We had to pester the DA a lot to keep sort of working on it and working on it. It is a squeaky wheel gets the grease situation. Um, and so the DA started building this case. Um, I think Lauren's gonna talk a little bit about what that was like because the DA did talk to APM help um, directly to help build that case. And eventually we did get a, um, a plea out of it. Um, this former bookkeeper did plead uh, guilty to a misdemeanor embezzlement charge um, or theft charge. And um, she was ordered to pay back the $40,000 of, um, of embezzled funds that uh, we found that were embezzled from us. So um, it was a long process. It took two years all in all. Um, it took up a lot of bandwidth, but at the end of it all, um, 
you know, we did get the money back. We did spend money with APM help that was um, well spent because we did get our books um, balanced and our, all of our bank accounts reconciled. We put in new processes about dealing with cash um, and, and also having different people in the office check the cash when it goes to the bank, when it comes back, the receipts, um, how we handle that. And, um, and we learned a lot about Appfolio in the process as well. So, you know, all in all, do I wish it wouldn't have happened? Yeah, but um, am I glad in a way that it did? I am. So, um, yeah, that's what happened to us. Uh, obviously, I hope it doesn't happen to anybody else. Uh, APM was a huge help for us. And, uh, and that's my story. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and uh, as, as a quick segue, I, I did want to bring in Lauren, who is also one of our senior consultants. Um, she was specifically working with Jesse primarily. Um, and so there are quite a few things or, or three main questions I wanted to ask Lauren um, just to kind of uh, talk about the process of what she actually had to do. And so, um, Lauren, while you were going through the bank catcher process, uh, did you kind of see any patterns um, that kind of tipped you off? on uh, what was going on? Yeah, I think one of the first things that hit me off was we had a lot of uncleared deposits. So, you know, sometimes you'll have receipts put into the wrong deposits, deposits the wrong dates, so forth and so on. And, you know, in this case, we we're lucky enough that the bank statements themselves had all of the deposit images. You know, we can track down the numbers for the reference numbers for most of those receipts, but we everything that was on the bank statement, we could still signed for the most part, but there were a ton still of just missing or, or unclear deposits that, you know, every month that seemed to be unrelated to anything that was going on in any of the bank accounts. And so, so that was the first thing. And then um, as we progressed with the cleanup, the other thing that I started to notice was that the deposits, the unclear deposits, those receipts in there, they either said cash, kind of starting at the beginning, as we progressed, they either had no reference number as everything else, the money orders, checks, everything else did have a reference number. And so the ones that were unclear didn't have any extra information. Um, so that was something that kind of brought up a red flag. Um, and then the last thing I think that kind of solidified the, uh, oh, this is probably a bad situation, was that every single month the bank balance was consistently decreasing. You know, unless you have some big change where you're letting go of, you know, a chunk of your, your properties, um, you know, you, you fluctuate up and down, but this is every single month we're, we're decreasing, decreasing. And that was combined with the other things I mentioned, the unclear deposits and the reference numbers and all that, it started to become pretty clear that there was a bigger issue. Cool. Uh, and then Lauren, what about specifically when you were working with the DA? What was the DA looking for? Uh, so the first thing was the, the total amount that we had calculated, which you know we kind of give a range of best case scenario, worst case scenario, uh, based on missing transactions, uncleared things, um, a few other factors. Um, how we calculated that, um, you know, where we're pulling that information from, so the reports in Apolio, um, the bank reconciliation report was the biggest most helpful tool. I think that we were able to provide was, you know, here's a list of missing transactions every single month, or excuse me, unclear deposits and unclear transactions. Um, and then also the, the patterns and warning signs that we saw. And then just overall, really a lot of clarification on how, how it fully works, really. And, you know, we can give them this information, but it's like, okay, well, how do we explain that to the jury? How do we explain that to you know, in court for everyone else to understand. Cool, so I think we uh, we all were very fortunate that I guess this didn't actually go to trial because if it did, trying to explain not only the industry, but trust accounting, property-based accounting, and then any specific software and how we like came to these conclusions would have been probably extremely hard, right? Um, and it could have been dragged out forever, so. Um, yeah, cool. Um, and then Lauren, last question, and this is more in general for all the attendees and anyone else in the future 
kind of watching this, you know, what are what are some good reports um, that you you would recommend people like just pull right, pull, pull the information occasionally and just see what they what you know what it says. Um, the bank reconciliation reports, number one, um, that's going to be your a really good way to check to see if you have uncleared uncleared items, right? If things were saying that this was receded, this was deposited in Appfolio, in Propertyware, in Buildium, but it never made it to the bank, that's, that's a problem. So we need to figure out why. Um, the other one would be the trust account balance report or, you know, that's for Appfolio or Propertyware would say the portfolio balance um, greater than zero dollars. That way we can see, you know, are things being booked on a property taking a negative that we're not aware of? You know, do we have any properties that are tied to this bank account that we're saying that we're not we're not aware that have negative funds? Cool. And I think for Buildium, the equivalent reports like the bank balance breakdown. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, which uh, which also essentially lists out for all properties or portfolios or owners associated with any one bank account. Here's the current balance, right? As the software thinks it is. Um, so again, all the softwares, or at least the, the three that we support, or we're 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 very experienced in, um, they all have these reports that you can pull to really help you guys understand this stuff. But very good, Jesse, Lauren, we greatly appreciate your time. Uh, we actually hit the mark on ten minutes left, and so um, we'd love to open up the uh, the Q and A in the chat. Um, just to any general questions from attendees. Um, yeah, that's, that's oh, and I should also note that one, as those questions come in, um, you know, obviously the, 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 the overarching theme here is where, where should you actually start? And so, um, you know, we at APM Help, and this is the shameless plug portion, I apologize everyone, uh, but we do do daily bank recs for our clients that use Appfolio, Propertyware, and Buildium. Um, and actually like Yardy Breeze and a handful of others. But um, I mean, you, you need to start with bank recs. If you're not doing bank recs, at least on a monthly basis, right? Like you got to start there because you're missing everything, right? Um, and we kind of do it a little better, right? Not only do we do bank recs, we do it on a daily basis. And so uh, with APM Help, we do provide 30 minute completely complimentary free consultations. You know, don't be scared. Don't, you know, don't think like, oh my gosh, like, what if I'm not doing bank recs? Like, or, you know, what's APM help going to do here? Like, look, we, we unfortunately have seen um, the worst of the worst. And uh, I don't think anything surprises us anymore. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's something where, you know, if you need help, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to at least take a look. We rip the bandaid off, give you a very black and white analysis of like, here's the state of your books. Um, and, and here are the recommendations, right? And whether or not you go with us or someone else that you may want to work with, no problems whatsoever, all right? Cool. Thanks, Annie, uh, for the shout outs. Any, um, any other questions from, I guess, attendees or maybe even Jesse? <laughs> No. Uh, sure, Michael. Um, from a cost standpoint, we currently charge two dollars per unit per month um, for bank recs. Th th there are, and that I, I should notate that's really for your main kind of vanilla property manager who has like a two bank setup. Um, it can get a little more complicated if you're an owner operator. You have a bunch of bank accounts for each entity, but high level the estimate is about two dollars per unit per month. No problem, you're welcome. Uh, Esteban, what's the minimum? We, I believe we have a minimum of $100 a month. So it's really kind of like 50 units, um, but don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to take a look. And you know, if you're pretty close to that, we, 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 we tend to be pretty flexible, at least on bank recs. And uh, if there are no other, 
if there are no other questions, I'd love to ask the audience. Um, cool, thank you, Karen. Um, if uh, just high level was 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 this presentation or webinar helpful for you guys? Did you guys enjoy it? Did you learn anything? Yes, uh, Michael Cox, we will absolutely take that feedback URL and we'll add it to the um, we'll add it to the YouTube and Facebook posts whenever we get it. Uh, because bank ACH or ACH info being changed absolutely needs to have an email alert. That there should be no reason why people are changing it uh, outside of the first time it's being inputted or maybe there was an error, but outside of that, it should never be changed. Well, I guess maybe if the client asks you to change it, but then there's a paper trail documenting, right? Like, hey, you know, I'd like my owner distribution to be you know, sent to a different bank account, fine. Cool, sounds good. And then uh, I guess a, as a final follow-up or shameless plug, um, we are looking to do more webinars and kind of podcast style formats in the future. We're gonna start with about one each quarter. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind, we'd love to either have you guys chat or just email us, info at APM help. Any other topics you guys would like us to cover? Um, and also like, we're trying not to make this like, obviously like a sales pitch per se. Now, obviously bank recs is important, but um, you know, one of the topics or things that we'd love to start doing is, you know, we know, um, we know you guys as PMs have amazing, uh, amazingly interesting stories of your day to day. And uh, we'd love to hear, it's almost like a fireside chat kind of format of just like, what are some crazy stories uh, that you guys are dealing with? And, uh, you know, we'd love to just, you know, have like a podcast style thing or a little mini webinar, um, 30 minutes of just like PMs and their stories, right? Um, and, and so if any of you guys are interested, would love to love to connect and love to do something, just shoot us an email, info at APM help or any of us that are on here, just our first names. So for example, mine is just taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R at apmhelp.com. Cool, and then Michael actually chatted and said, uh, you had a bookkeeper email him asking to change ACH info for the owner payments. He got the info, um, but the first thing he did was he absolutely, and this is fantastic, Michael, you did this. He reached out to the owner to confirm if it was authorized by that. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of like nowadays with like any kind of wire transfer, a lot of times like you can't just rely on like title companies, I believe do this where they're like in big red and on in all their signatures, they have like, you know, always double check the PDF, the bank routing and account information. Call us, we're happy to, you know, you know, verify it, right? Because sometimes there are man in the middle attacks and things and like people will, you know, change the, the they'll, they'll intercept the email, change the bank routing PDF and then send it off and walk away with however much you were gonna send. So absolutely be careful. Well, very good. We'll give it one more minute here. And if uh, there are no more comments or questions, um, again, hopefully you guys all enjoyed this and uh, we, 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 we look forward to seeing you guys on the next one and hopefully uh, hear from y'all on, on, on some of the crazy stories you guys have. Cool. Michael, we, we would uh, love to hear it. My, Michael, has, Michael has volunteered to be our next uh, panelist or storyteller on wire fraud attacks. And so uh, would love to hear it. Cool. A lot of really great, scary basement stories, if you're interested. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think I was telling Jesse in our practice session, we had one client that was telling us about um, on a move out, uh, or not necessarily move out, but like, it was kind of like a, uh, the tenant just stopped paying, whatever it was, um, like the neighbor or something started complaining about a really bad foul smell. You know, so of course the PM was like going in and was scared that they're going to find a dead body, but ended up finding, long story short, a 500 pound pig that was living in one of the rooms. <laughs> um, and and uh, so again, some, some crazy PM stories, love to hear them. 
Um, I think everyone in the industry would love to hear them as well because maybe sometimes they can relate. <laughs> cool. Well, anyways, sounds good, everyone. Greatly appreciate uh, everyone's time and attention, and we look forward to doing more of these. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.